looks like we're back. Uh, I did <laughs> had to look at my history, but here's uh, if you're still around the bonus. Here's the Daily Jewel. It was dailyjewel.app. Um, and you know, it's it's a table. <laughs> it, you can navigate between days. Uh, you can search for an item like, uh, I don't know, granola. Uh, no quick, no fastly found results, but we can reach out to open food facts and there's results and you can click one and you get breakdown. Yeah, it's all right. It's got some some warts and stuff that needs to be done. The the UI here is especially kind of janky, where it's like it's a modal inside of a modal inside of a modal. Uh, effectively, so you have like add and cancel here, but you also have done. So like if you click this, it's you're still there, which I don't know. And there's settings. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that didn't load. You you don't need to know my. Uh, my, my stats. <laughs> but yeah. Maybe at some point I will open source it or open up for uh, people to use or both. But, uh, but yeah. So, uh, a bit more focus on the front end on that project. Whereas this is more focused on the back end and figuring out how to like call uh, open AIs, APIs, and how to uh, use FFmpeg in a much different ways and more backend stuff with Rust. Although at some point, I think pretty soon on this project, I will be more front end focused uh, on stream. I have some things I've been working on, on off stream that I want to bring in. But, uh, but yeah, so with expiration, this method here takes a set expiry, whatever that is. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is Frosty Tools. So it is a, uh, it's it's not my thing. <laughs> it is, uh, it is a, uh, a bot that someone else made and you can just add that to your stream. Um, like you just, um, you go to their website, which I think if you, if you go to the, like, you look at their, like click their username and uh, go to their channel and there's some info there. They have like a discord and all that. But yeah, I, I'm assuming they're using some LLM and they're scraping like stream titles and uh, chat messages and building it. Yeah, yeah. I came across a stream, um, I don't know, many months ago at this point that was using it and I've seen it more and more. Uh, and it's pretty neat because like I used it to generate raid messages before we go off and raid someone else and it will like look at my stream title and look at their stream title and make a, a message <laughs> to, uh, to, for everyone to, to send over there, that sort of thing. Um, there's some other options too that you can turn on. Like if uh, someone chats for the first time, it will do a thing. I, I think I don't have that one turned on, but what, what is a set expiry? Helper enum that is used to define expiry time. So there must be something that implements the conversion. Okay, that's from here. So is there something that converts? No. Really? Uh, too many parents there. 
set options, and then uh, I just pass this in to here. Maybe it'll be happy. Why no? Get it. Oh, set with options. It's a different name. <laughs> Heading off, have a great day. Yeah, you too. You have a good rest of your Sunday. Thanks for stopping by. Chatting for a bit. Uh, and of course here, I also don't want, <laughs> I also don't want to um, uh, have this crash the process. So we'll do match here as well. Uh, what's fun, so the reason I had this let underscore be the unit type was because uh, the Redis client needs some hints as to like what we are expecting to get back. I think though, the nav that we I'm using match and I'm saying the okay path will be the unit type, that'll be the parameter that we're handling. I think we can get away with that doing this let here and it won't give uh, any any type confusion. And we could probably do the same here as well. Let's just be a little bit more concise. Okay, so now when we save the access token, it will expire uh, when the access token expires. Is that what that means? Lifetime in seconds of the access token. Let's go back, look at, uh, <laughs> go back and look at the token response. So we have an access token. We have a refresh token. Um, and we have expires in. We have token type. Fields defined in RFC 6749. Maybe I should read that at some point. Okay, so access token, access token issued by the authorization server. Token type expires in, oh, expire in one hour from the time the response was generated. If permitted, the authorization server should provide the expiration time via other means. I think one thing that I did see Copilot doing that maybe I do want to mirror is that there is potentially some delay between there's, I don't know, a second, less than a second. It's probably less than a second delay. Um, thinking maybe I want to make the TTL on the storage of the access token be slightly less than the expiry time. this value to be something that is closer to what it actually is. Time to live. Okay, expires in lifetime of the access token. So the refresh token, refresh token, which can be used to obtain new access tokens using the same authorization grant as the scribes. more like I have the sense that the idea is the refresh token will be valid for longer than the access token but I just want to validate that that is, is really what the statement says to the client by the authorization server you to obtain a new access token when the current access token becomes invalid or expires or to obtain additional access tokens with identical or narrower scope Optional discretion of the server. If it issues a refresh token, it's included when issuing the access token. 
garbage token is a string representing the authorization going to the client uh, by the resource owner. String is usually opaque. Good. Uh, garbage tokens are intended only for use with authorization servers and never since resource servers. Okay. Cool. So I think that is what all we need to do for these two endpoints. Now, I think actually, like we're at a point now where the back end will work again. <laughs> like the other stuff, like uh, obtaining the updated refresh token, granted these things, um, like get refresh token, don't use the OAuth2 crate, but this should be doing the same thing as the crate would be doing. And I do want to update this because I don't want any of this custom code. Um, and something I might want to think about doing at some point is actually taking these, um, these endpoints and consolidating them uh, so that I don't have separate endpoints for YouTube and Twitch. I just have one set of endpoints that are then configured um, via parameters for both. So even cutting out even more duplication. Maybe that will be possible. Uh, we'll have to explore that a little bit. But for now, let's uh, let's keep going with this. So on the back end, I think things should be workable. Uh, but on the front end, I've broken things. So switching over to the front end. How does this work? So we have some components. We have a login button, login page, popout.ts. So popout.ts is a thing that helps us um, launch a, a pop-out window and uh, this code is uh, what's used to handle to have a button that you can click it's just outside of the react app uh, but yeah here we go so login button is the thing let me let me go over to the UI so we have login with YouTube up here so what this is the, that button and the idea is, is that I call YouTube login in the data provider and it returns a URL. Um, and that URL is opened in a pop-up window. Now what's fun that URL is not the URL that we get back from calling get login handler. So that's not the OAuth endpoint. There's a layer of indirection there. Uh, let me go find the data provider. Well, that's in here somewhere. Here we go. YouTube login. So we call. Okay. YouTube login. Do I fetch that? We get the URL. Oh. And changing this, did I break something? I didn't mean to. Is it? Hold on. Let's, uh, let's. Let's look at what we've actually changed so far. So in here, show my notations, not very helpful right now. Um, so what we were doing before, off your eye. Big. Docker 
uh, Docker Compose. There we go. So in API. Yeah, YouTube Auth URI is actually localhost. YouTube login. The idea being that we would take all the parameters, we tack them onto this URL, and we open a pop up window to the, the local app. And then the local app forwards those uh, parameters to the actual uh, URI somehow. That was in pop out, was it? Yes. Yeah, so here we're reading the actual environment variable for the auth URI and we're providing it to the front end and the front end owns uh, sending the user to the right place from popout.ts. We just pass through all the query parameters. So some things you're gonna have to change. Uh, the first being that you need to actually return this object here. Um, and this is not gonna really help me, but I am gonna annotate promise. Uh, I'm gonna annotate the, uh, the type here. The reason it's not gonna help me is because how I'm using the data providers in the components um, is abstracted from the actual implementation from data provider .ts. So the components don't see these types, but just for my own <laughs> keeping track of what's going on. Uh, so if we go back here, the response we're getting is the one from Git login handler, which is the shape uh, of auth request. So authorize URL, so it's not even URL. So that's already, already broken. Uh, authorize URL, uh, is it code? No, it's not code. CSRF state. And uh, AC code verifier. So these are the things that are coming back uh, from this endpoint. That means also YouTube callback is, is not right either because we're going to need to pass more things to host back to here. Need these four things. this right through. So I do foresee a problem though. Um, and that problem is that the CSRF state, and PKCE code verifier are state that need to persist um, and they need to persist through this redirect somehow. Now, I don't, I don't think that's that bad, right? So, um, one thing I want to do is, despite the fact that, yes, this type is not going to matter, I do want to preserve the shape of this. Is there a refactor that will extract to uh, interface? Uh, yeah, there you go. So that updated this to be a promise of that, that interface. Uh, and well, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna kinda close down. 
some things we don't need right now, just to make it a little easier to navigate around. So in login button, when we get this uh, response from YouTube login, what we get is things that uh, are in this, uh, oh, we must not have exported the type. Normally, if you have an export a type, you get a suggestion to be able to import it elsewhere. All right, and then from that, we just need all the things. URL. And it's not, author it's not URL, it's authorized URL. Uh, CSR update and... <sighs> what do we do with this? Well, we have to pass this through. Well, we should really be in a situation where we don't actually get these two values. Um, we could hit a back end endpoint. Um, I'm thinking how much I want to change this versus just keeping what's currently going on and then deal with uh, changes later. So the way it works right now, this authorized URL, um, because of what we've changed in the backend so far, this will actually be the URL to go to YouTube, uh, slash Google, the Google login page stuff. Um, and I didn't really want that specifically because when you hit that page, it lists my Google accounts that I recently logged into. And especially for being on stream and showing this off, what I wanted to land on, it was kind of like a, a transition page where it says, okay, yes, I actually want to do this and proceed. And then on the next, like you click the button or the link, and then it actually takes you to the place, which is why it's set up like this. So one option would be that I actually, I guess I've already, I've already done the thing, right? Because in uh, youtube.rs, when we're setting up inside of uh, Git Login Handler, when we're setting up the client and I pass in the um, things, must have been, must be inside of Git Google Auth yeah, here. When I pass in the auth URL, so this YouTube auth URI, this is actually localhost. This is the, the app, not the actual real one. So, um, this part will work the same way where URL here will actually be localhost. Oops. So in popout.ts, what happens? We get a click. We construct the URL and we do a redirect. Um, and then that redirect does redirect back to uh, our app, to a route that provides login page.tsx. And this is what reads the code from the window.location.search. Uh, and of course, YouTube, YouTube callback is now different. So we changed that in data provider. YouTube callback now takes code and state and CSR token and these things. So we need these things. Short. Sure. 
which we don't have. So how do we get them? Well, um, state. So which one of these will be in the URL? state is the one that will be in the URL. Uh, so we can do the same thing here. So not state. Do if. So if, if state's missing, we also bail out. Um, now, how do we get CSRF token, uh, CSRF state and PKC code verifier? Well, those aren't going to come back in the, the URL um, that we land on from the redirect from Google slash YouTube. So uh, those need to be somewhere. And uh, the, the proper answer is really these should, I think, be stored in the back end and not route through the front end like this. But um, for now, uh, how can I sneak state through to persist over a, uh, like, <laughs> going to a different domain and coming back is a question. Um, hmm. Uh, local storage uh, or session storage in the browser is probably uh, the only good way of doing that. If I wanted to change this around to have these bits of data persist in the back end. I would essentially need to have, I would need to create some kind of like, some kind of session object stored somewhere. And create that at the initiation of this process. And then when we flow back to here, um, that would probably be what's inside a state. Like we would pack in our CSRF token and other things either here or maybe there's some other place that will pass through. Um, in fact, I have to check. There's probably some stuff we could like sneak into the URL passing through Google and back to us, but I don't really want to do that. I think what I will do. Yeah, <laughs> it knows. It, it can see where this is going. Okay, so to do, to, to boot, to do, uh, don't pass this information through front end. Like my gut feel here is that this is not a good idea. that we are trusting the front end too much because reasons. <laughs> that there is there is probably a uh, I'll take I I'll, I'll take a couple seconds to explain kind of the general direction of why this is a problem without going into like fleshing out like how you would use this to like compromise something but essentially, you know, if this was um, an API that was accessible to the internet, anyone can call these backend URL endpoints. Um, so you could, for instance, make a, a fake front end on some other domain, um, potentially, especially if you don't have the right um, core stuff set up, or you have the wrong core stuff set up um, for protection against cross domain, or uh, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if if this if this was a live API, you could potentially make a front end on some other domain, some like fake domain that looks like the real domain, and then that would call some some backend API on your your fake domain that would then call the real domain and pretend to be a real user. Uh, and it would be able to get 
these internal state values something yeah like i said i'm not gonna get into trying to like go through exactly how that would work but it feels like that's not something you actually want to do which is hence <laughs> the, hence the to do but i'm not putting this on the public internet this is not something for anyone else to use right now so uh don't don't do this Uh, let's see. There we go. That that warning there as well. Okay, so now the things are flowing through the front end. Uh maybe properly. Uh First thing I'll do, let me go ahead and uh, uh, redeploy things. And, uh, I think we should be able to see this working. At least as far as like the, the auth flow stuff. Then... I think I will continue working on the YouTube side of things. We have these other functions that still implement OAuth stuff themselves that we can convert over. And then from there, we can um, kind of evaluate how things are and if, they, if this needs to be improved and then we can switch over to working on the Twitch side. Refresh token is used in the extractor, but get refresh token is only used by update refresh token. Is that right? Okay. This is actually wrong in, in what it's trying to do. I think all we really want to try to do. Here is re is get a new to refresh the access token. I I don't know if that will get us a new refresh token in, in actuality. Uh, so let's let's change the description of this to be what we actually want it to do, which is to uh, new access. Token. Refresh access token. Interesting here, update ref refresh token. Not what's going on here. In, in our extractor, we attempt to get the access token if it's there. If it's not there, then we attempt to get an, a new... <laughs> we attempt to get a new access token. Um, so we get a connection. We 
get the refresh token from Redis. If it's not there, that's an error. Otherwise, we return it. Um, we we have it, and then we call refresh access token. Something like story of like how these things interact doesn't doesn't make sense, right? Right, because we we're not trying to update the refresh token. We are trying to um, get a new access token, right? Which is what this is doing. Except this one is not interacting with Redis. This is like the lower level. How do we interact with the unit? Um, the... Is this right? I suspect not. And this has probably been broken the whole time, which actually makes a lot of sense uh, because I have noticed that um, anytime I want to do an upload, if I want it to work, I do need to re auth. So I'm guessing all of this has been broken for a long time, or since, since the beginning. Um, so I'm gonna we're, we're gonna investigate that a little bit more. But first, let's actually see if the changes I have made so far have completely worked everything. So, uh, no errors in the console yet. If I click login with YouTube, yeah, we get my pop-up. And like I said, it, it is just a, like an interstitial page that I have. Uh, you click proceed. You can't see this part. I don't want to share all of my Google accounts with the world, um, but uh, let's see, I don't think there's anything sensitive in this URL. Oh, maybe. We have challenge method, redirect URI. Um, such a long URL. There we go. Oop, code challenge, code challenge method. State, that's the CSRF token. Um, client ID, so that all looks right. So to give you an example, this part I think I can show on stream. Right, so, go challenge method, redirect URI, scope, those things. So when I click the button, it's going to take all the query string parameters, but actually attach them to the right domain to do uh, to send me to Google. I click proceed. I get a list of my accounts. I select the right account. I select the uh, YouTube brand, and then we end up with something like this. Confirming. Make sure you trust glowing telegram. Oh, I, I trust glowing telegram. <laughs> uh, so I should be able to click this and logged in with YouTube. You can now close this window. So that's something I've not figured out. If, if I want to do this this way, um, it just like lands back in the app. What I could do instead is I could have the redirect URI coming back from Google actually go to the back end and just have a static HTML page render it up from there and not land in the actual like React front end. Um, or something like, you know, landing on a static page or something. Uh, well, it couldn't be a static page. It would need, because it has to take the, um, like what we're doing here is we're getting the code state from Google and we're using that to then get our access token and refresh token and store it in, in Redis. So there needs to be some code that does that logic. That's that post uh, login handler. 
Um, but like we could have the redirect URI that's registered with Google to actually go directly to that endpoint and have it return HTML. And it would just be like, you know, a static, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be this. It would just be a, all right, complete. And we could have a thing that auto tries to auto close the, the pop out if I, if I want to do it that way. But yeah, so now I should be logged in. So that seemed to have worked. If I pull up Redis, um, well, not look at the, oh, interesting. Introducing Redis Copilot, your new AI powered companion. No thanks. So there's a refresh token. I'm not gonna open that on stream. Uh, there is the access token. Uh, I will open, oh look, time to live. There we go, this is, this is all I care about anyway. Time to live, 57 minutes, 46 seconds. So the question is, is that because of the default or is that what was returned? And our refresh token doesn't have a uh, expiry, no, okay. So if I go over to Docker um, and look at the API container. Now, if I've done this right, there should be nothing secret in the logs. There you go. So like PKCE could verify or redacted. CSRF token redacted. State redacted. Authorization code redacted. Um, that's mostly courtesy of the OAuth2. Uh, crate, which also uses redact like I do. So we can see that there. Um, but what I want to look for is if we logged that message that there was not a expiration, a um, expires in on the response. Uh, so A YouTube login finished. It's a lot of messages. <laughs> Why so many messages? Uh, okay, so where do we start? Where do we first start with YouTube login? Okay, started processing request, start a new connection, resolving. Starting new connection, resolving. Uh, lots of connection stuff here. So the 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 key thing I think for me to look at logs like this is that fortunately I do have like coloring, but you can see like debug, debug, debug on kind of a regular cadence, right? So I can look at that and I can see where does the text kind of stop right there. All right, so we have a lot of like we're connected to Redis. Uh, we are uh, doing various TLS things. I think that's where a lot of <laughs> debugging is coming from is uh, that. Uh, cool idle connection. Uh, send for it. Okay. Using Cypher Suite. Client connection bound. Um, like at the point where we stop seeing stuff about OAuth 2 uh, and talking to Google, that's the point where that login message or the, the message about not having that expiration would be. I mean, alternatively, I can go back to the code, grab the message that we're lo tracing, logging, and search for it here. That is gonna be more conclusive of whether or not it happened or not. But it's, I, I don't see the error or the message, the warning, the whatever. Um, so, in post login handler. Mm 
are debugging this. This is the debug message. Doesn't appear to be in here, which is a good sign. Uh, eight twenty-five. Okay, this is when the service started this last time, and it's it's not in here. So, uh, good. So I guess uh, it's good for an hour. Uh, well, that's good to know. Uh, but also means that uh, one of the things that is a problem right now that we're not going to solve with this, but we do need to solve is that when the front end attempts to do something, um, and specifically when the front end tries to start some asynchronous job, and in the background, it relies on there being an authenticated session do need some way for the process to say, hey, you need to re-authenticate and uh, then resume rather than forcing the user to log in and then restart the asynchronous process. Like, you know, if we end up in a situation where there's a bunch of stuff, uh, like, a bunch of like um, processes that are tied together that we want to start as one task. We don't want to make the user restart that. And even worse, if there's like, okay, the user selects like 20 things and queues them up, not having to find the ones that failed and queue them. Uh, so anyway, that's a, that's a problem for a different day. Today, we're just trying to clean up the code here. Um, let's start with this, with refresh at, so this is the kind of the lower level thing that's supposed to be getting um, a new access token. So I think one thing I want to do is I'm going to change this. Do something like this be explicitly like, okay, we're going to return a new access token. Um, that's not going to be sufficient, actually, as I, as I think about it. Because let's, let's, let's return a tuple that will be the access token in the duration. And then I'm gonna just wipe out the current implementation and see if Copilot will generate. Yeah, there you go. It sees that I've already implemented a thing where I'm calling uh, get Google Auth to the client, and maybe it will actually do the thing, right? So what did it, what did it give me? So it's getting the OAuth to client, and then yeah, we we're not we're not qualifying. Uh, and then we're trying to get a token response by calling OAuth2 client that exchange refresh token. And this is supposed to take a refresh token, not an authorization code. I don't know what that is supposed to be. Get out of here. So a refresh token is this thing. I don't suppose we implement Okay, so can we just make a refresh token? Like that. What's the problem? Expected a reference. Okay. Okay, 
So far, so good. So that gets us a token response. Uh, and then we get an access token. And then we get the TTL. We have this logic here. Uh, so the first thing that screams at me is that, hey, we are doing the literal same thing with logic and values and stuff in two places now. So uh, we should do better. Let us refactor this by extracting into a function. We'll rename it. Calculate access token expiration. TTL. I like TTL, although not with the underscores. If I did something like this, Get away with that. No. Consider restricting type T to be something. Where EF is extra token fields, uh, implements, uh, TT is token type. Can I just mirror this? Where are you? EFTT. EFTT. extra token fields it's a trait right from somewhere public trait too good extra token fields and on oh it is token day okay like this though expected unit found duration uh right uh oh yeah uh let's see i think maybe i need parentheses there we go all right gets confused it thinks like this is a statement and then what I'm trying to do is do a unary like uh, negative uh, on on this this value without the parents okay cool so then I'm calling uh, this is all wrong, but I don't care about that uh, I'm calling uh, calculate access token TTL here and honestly at this point could uh, just call this down there, but whatever. Let's just do it this way. Uh, so the other, pl the the whole point of this, right, was that I was already doing this logic elsewhere. So now I don't have to have that logic twice. Just have that there as well. And uh, ta-da! All right. Does the rest of this work? It seems like it, right? So we set the new access token, and. Uh, and then we return it. Oh, that's fun. Um, I guess this does that. This this ended up implementing everything, right? It it say it updates Redis after it gets it, um, which is fine. Then I really don't need this method at all, right? Because that was what this thing did. So instead, I go up to wherever there, down to wherever there is. 
There it is. And change this code, right? So we call refresh access token, uh, which takes state and the refresh token. I guess I don't have the refresh token here. So let's change this now. We don't get, we don't have the refresh token yet. Uh, we do need it here. So let's get the refresh token by moving our connection to Redis up. And we'll just do all the work in one function. Like so. Uh, oops, that's supposed to be match. We're, we're doing error handling. Okay, there we go. This one like that. Um, need to call that await, probably. And have a semicolon. Okay, so now refresh access token does the whole thing. It just like it, it takes state, it uh, sets up the OAuth client, it talks to Redis, it gets the current refresh token, uh, bails out if it can't find it, does the, the exchange, gets a new access token, saves it in Redis and returns it, and the TTL, right? So now here, um, we unpack this as access token, um, well, here's the fun thing, right? Is that at this point, we don't need to return the TTL. Uh, the way uh, Copilot ended up implementing this for me, we we don't need the TTL because we store that already in Redis. I was thinking we were gonna store that separately and that is maybe better. I don't know. This, this, does, this does the thing that we needed to do. So I guess it's fine. Um, where we want to return just access token. All right. Cool. So that is. That, that is more like how I do things. All right, so that is, I guess, the last of the custom OAuth code in YouTube.rs. Doing the token refresh flow. Um, another thing that I could potentially do, instead of the dealing with the thing I was talking about before where our access token expires, is I could get set up something that on a regular basis will do a, a refresh of the access token again. Actually, I take back something I said before, right? Because I said there was issues with the token expiring. I wonder, even if the access token expires, if we can, how long we can continue to use the refresh token? I don't know. Maybe this will actually work this time and um, the the session will be uh, more persistent. I don't know. But uh, I think it's time for another break because it's been somehow another hour since, since the last one. So uh, I'm gonna go stretch my legs and get some water and I'll be back in just a few minutes.